The following documentary about the Mark of the Beast stands out from many others in a number of significant ways. It was produced way back in 2010 by a group of Christians who have been preaching about the Mark since the 1980s, well before microchip implants even existed. At the time of production, microchip implants in humans were quite new. They were mostly done in the upper arm rather than the hand, and mostly for medical purposes. But what is especially different about this documentary is that it managed to get a great variety of people to question themselves in terms of how far they would go in resisting a microchip implant for the purpose of buying and selling. This led to some very significant comments, including one church minister stating that we can accept the mark and still be Christians, and another minister confessing that their denomination add to the revelation so as to push their interpretation of the prophecy about the mark of the beast. Most importantly, towards the end of the documentary, it presents the radical lifestyle of two isolated individuals who have learned to live without money, and it shows how that relates to resisting the temptation to accept the mark of the beast. Even if you've seen this documentary before, watch it again, carefully, paying close attention to the arguments that people raise to defend accepting the mark of the beast. Listen to the experience of those who have dropped out of the economic system in order to provide an example of the kind of lifestyle all sincere Christians will have to adopt in the very near future. The latest technology for identifying people at the point of sale, for identifying people when they make purchases, is actually the implantable chip that you can actually embed directly into human flesh. Uh, it's a tiny glass capsule about the size of a grain of rice. It contains an RFID computer chip. I think that within 20 years when you get born you will get a chip. increasing amount of support for a microchip for buying and selling. Some people are kind of saying uh, that people are going to be forced to take it, but I think eventually people will be keying up themselves and taking it. I would not have a problem at all if they wanted to put a microchip in me to help out with any kind of medical security, anything. I'd be fine with it. Uh, I saw my thing about the money and the banking. I hope uh, in the future I can take one in my right hand. I think, I think it's very cool actually. It's a cool concept. If I was to have a microchip which would benefit me on a personal level, I wouldn't have any problems with the ramifications. Like for instance, if I, if I had a microchip which would allow me uh, you know, discounts say on like toll roads or purely financial reasons, which was exclusive for that, then I'd have no problem. I got chipped. My whole office is getting the chip. I already got the chip. I got the chip. We, we got, got the chip. chip. Now, the points that are most being used to sell the implantable microchip to people are causing a lot of fear and paranoia amongst conspiracy theorists. 
you know, fears like giving the government too much control. They're trying to bring in the RF chips um, as a form of control to all of us human beings. If you don't do as you're told, if you don't conform to the authority, you don't conform to controls, um, you will have your chip turned off and you will not have anything. And then if they turn that off, you can't go into shops, you won't be able to get into the doors, all electronically. The idea of having one as a thin edge of a wedge, as a way of social control and monitoring, I think that's very, very dangerous. When I read the book with Barry Smith, it brought up for me the significance of the Antichrist and controlling of people. That's what it brought up. Second, yeah, the Antichrist. You know, you see these fictional movies and you see their implants and it controls you. First, we take a gloomy, dissatisfied woman. We locate her brain. We insert a few nano chips. Finally, we enhance her to fit the ideal specifications. Welcome to the future. It's a really scary prospect. I'm sorry. Really scary. Well, I, I think they're worried about the wrong thing. They're, they're panicking like about the wrong stuff. We've come to accept that kind of technology in the past. Things like social security and credit cards. Those, uh, that was always a concern there, but now people have just come to accept it. I think they'll do the same thing with microchip implants. Personally, I feel that these fear merchants, they do their own cause a disservice. I mean, it's not some tyrant from outside that's going to control us. It's our own inner tyrant, our own greed, that's going to lead us to line up for something like a microchip. When talk turns, to the microchip implant being used for buying and selling. Control or no control, I think most people would change their story. I, I feel very strongly that I would say no, but when it comes to you can't travel or maybe you can't get a job or you can't get social services, I think that was um, pretty disturbing because that's the point at which most people are going to, even if they wanted to say no, might be, feel forced to say yes. Are there any conditions under which I would allow myself to be microchipped? I don't think so. So basically what you're saying is um, either you're in this monetary system with the, the microchip monetized system or you're outside of that system and you're, you're asking me is what would I choose? If you take the blue pill, the story ends, you wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland, and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Well, you know, that, that's a difficult question, because <laughs> we all like creature comforts, you know, we all like to have a house. My biggest theory is that it's not ever going to be implemented. I think it's very scary what you're talking about with that company that it put it in your hand and you know might get to that point where you need to have that or you can't buy anything and I think it's very very scary. I would hope that this company that it wouldn't get pushed to the to the point you were talking about but uh, yeah that's that's all I have to say. If it was an essential to life, which again, I hope it would never be, I would put it in my body. But I would hope it never would come to that point. Would you take the very chip? Uh, no way, no, yeah. no. Well, if I, if I had to have one to participate within the community, well, for the well-being of my family, I might be forced to, yes. But um, I'm hoping it doesn't, it doesn't get to that. Okay, with the very cheap, I would not take it on. I think I think if it got to the point where if you didn't have a very cheap in you, then you couldn't work, you couldn't earn money, you couldn't pay rent. I guess then you there's not much choice but to conform and to go with it. But I don't see that would happen anytime soon. I don't think anyway. I've noticed when it starts costing people personally, you know, i.e. that they won't be able to buy or sell penny drops, they go into denial, and they don't even want to face the fact that they've surrendered already. I mean, it's like they've just caved in, but they don't even want to face it. And that's really disturbing. Yeah, the issue that concerns me the most on that is just money in general. You know, whether it's a, a microchip implant for buying or selling or, or just plain cash, people are too dependent on it. And the vast majority of society have more faith in money than they do in God. Yeah, there used to be a lot of talk about the mark of the beast in the churches, but it doesn't seem to be any more of that. I'm a Church of England. My particular church 
have not discussed about the mark of the beast. The Church of England, I think they're more very politically correct and they don't want to tread on people's toes. I'm Assistant Minister of Grace Church, Dulwich. Yeah, I wouldn't have a problem buying with buying or selling or, or using money in this way. I personally don't have a, a problem with this idea of having a, a, a microchip put in your arm as a sort of, I don't know, credit card that, that you can buy and sell in clubs or go down to Sainsbury's and buy your food. No, I, I would not have a problem with that as a Christian. I think you can worship Jesus Christ whilst at the same time having a mark in, in, in your arm, yes. I'm aware that some Christians would consider that a cashless society is a kind of um, answer to a prophetic text we find in the book of Revelation, that no one can buy or sell who does not have the mark. So it could be, well, if you don't have the right credit card or something else, a chip somewhere, you are lost. I can understand this kind of interpretation. Uh, according to um, our interpretation as uh, Adventists, Seventh-day Adventists, we consider that this idea of worship is a dominant theme here in chapter 13. And when we say worship, we add a small word to explain. Day of worship. This idea of selling or buying is not the main topic of chapter 13. We would consider that the Sabbath, that is Saturday, is the day of worship of the believers, the children of God, and there is another day, which is the Sunday, all right? The mark of the beast would be, okay, you go for the Sunday. The mark of the beast is the Sunday worship. If I was given a microchip, to, 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 to shop and to do what I have to do with. I'll accept it won't be the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast is when you go against God's holy day. My church has discussed the microchip. When it's given out, if it has nothing to do with the law of God, it can be received and used. Not so many churches have taught about the mark of the beast. They actually, they actually are silent about it, and they don't really teach you about it and how to avoid it. My, my particular church have not discussed about the mark of the beast. If you want to have a, a congregation that's big, or you want to have people follow you, then you've got to speak about prosperity like okay God is gonna raise you up or God is gonna give you this he's gonna heal you he's gonna give you this or that and I've been trying to show you that the Bible teaches that God wants you to be rich that God wants you to prosper he wants you to be abundantly supplied if you concentrate on prosperity and you think your life revolves around money then you're worshiping the best and when we say worship we add a small word to explain, day of worship. I think you can worship Jesus Christ whilst at the same time having a mark in, in, in your arm, yes. Most of the churches, or the vast majority of the churches, are not teaching the, um, the masses or the followers, that would be followers of Christ, about the money, and, and that the money is a way of worshipping is a form of worshipping the beast. Hallelujah! Money! Come to me now! Money! Come to me now! Money! Oh! I'll be out walk on this money! Woo! Woo! Howdy! Woo! Get some anointing! You put some up here! Woo! Put this anointing on it! Tell you what, you put something up here. I'm putting, putting this on nothing on this money, man. Woo! 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 Hallelujah! Club 700 has actually had very cheap on who have basically stated, look, this isn't the mark of the beast because it has not been mandated by government. Yeah, it's interesting that we now have 
something that matches the prophecy in the revelation about the mark of the beast. You're talking about a chip that goes inside your hand and you use it to buy or sell. Now that's ironic. It's clear that it's no longer some kind of fanciful imagination, but churches have totally lost interest all of a sudden. Yeah. Yeah, yeah like even like even like trying to get an interview with a minister, mm -hmm. uh, you know, on the topic of Bible prophecy is pretty near impossible these days. Yeah. You know, and I think those that do agree to you know, to be interviewed, I reckon that they must probably get disciplined about it afterwards because it shows them up. It shows it shows them up that they haven't got a clue, you know, they don't well, really know. Yeah. Well, is it really that clear? Well, what do you mean by that? Well, are we just assuming that it's it's the connection between the, the prophecy and the revelation and the microchip implant is really that clear? Well, maybe, maybe what we could do is like go out on the street and um, show people you know, the Bible passage, show people like the article about the very chip and uh, talk to people, you know, explain to people about the very chip and see if people see it as clearly as yeah. we do. Yeah, why not? We've got the equipment, we've got the resources, we've got the motivation, let's do it. Yeah. Okay. Did you pat the mic? Have you got any spare batteries? Uh, yeah. I think so, we've got some tapes. Excellent. Alright, London, here we come. Jess, we'll give you a call when we get to town, okay? Alright, uh, take care. Alright, see you. Bye bye. See ya. And we're wanting to ask people directly, people from different backgrounds, about whether they're aware of this development towards the cashless society using microchip implants. Okay. And it causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond. To receive a mark in their right hand or their foreheads and that no man might buy or sell, save he that he had the mark, or the name of the beast, or number of his name. <laughs> it's just a book, isn't it? You know, I haven't got a lot of time for the Bible. To me, that's just words. It doesn't really mean anything, you know. The Bible clearly lets us understand that the mark will be for trading and for buying, for selling. The choice will be, are we willing and ready to die for what we believe in? And if it means to die um, and to not accept the mark, then that is what will have to be done. It seems to me that some people would think it just makes sense to have a chip rather than do something to do with the Bible. Sure. Can you see any link at all? Um, with, with well, passage obviously, and but I think it's a Possibly. major coincidence. Yeah, I don't think it's possible that someone 2,000 years ago could have prophesied about any scientific developments today. I don't think God has any place in science. So what is it trying to say is that if you have that in your body, that you may be showing the mark of the... It is, it's, it's not, I, don't, I don't really believe in coincidence so much. I, 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 I just, just I, I, my, my personal opinion, I, I just don't think that has any any relation to what the financial system is. Why they would, what, the, why would they put into barcodes the, the, the number? How that number has any relevance? If it did, it could be coincidental. But if there was some, I don't know, allegiance within the secret allegiance of the financial system around the world who are doing whatever to do this, I think there's a lot easier ways to do this and track our information and track what we do to do that by what we do in our cash machine or what we shop at Tesco's. Yeah, it was really interesting seeing the, the various reactions and, and you could see that even the people who argued against the connection, like were, were aware that it was like a huge coincidence as they called it, they just didn't have any answers for it. Yeah. I was also impressed actually how many people, you know, just out there on the street had a grasp, uh, you know, had a really good understanding of the whole concept, mm. even though sometimes, you know, they had no religious background mm. at all. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And there are a few people I spoke to who could see that there really would be pressure on them to take this chip. You know, a chip that the marketers and makers of it say would, they would never force on anybody. Yeah, right. <laughs> Should we keep yeah. watching? Yeah. Yeah. But there is a fine line between that. Well, I don't see the relevance in that. But I think what you're right, I know it's not your opinion, but maybe it is, I don't know. But 
I, I know that we are being tracked and we are being traced and our information is being sold and it is being passed, but whether this has any relation to that, I don't think so, my personal belief. There's no way I'd want to put the chip into my body if it's been said before that it's going to be part of some beast or whatever else it's going to be. So I wouldn't want to do it. I would totally see where this would tie into the whole Revelations uh, Antichrist thing. But I could see definitely how people would think that uh, a microchip could be construed as a mark of the beast. If it comes down to that, it, that uh, the chip is the mark of the beast, and, and because of my Christian faith, I will never wear it. The Christian faith and several other faiths have intertwined into it a mark of the beast concept, mark of the beast concept, which is generally seen these days and uh, accepted as uh, the microchip. It's going to have a massive uh, uh, effect on people uh, consciously and in their communities. There's going to be a rejection um, on that level alone. If I was to be cut off, I, I still wouldn't take the the chip. I would would find a community, um, no matter how, how, how hard it took, that didn't require um, that level of submission. Yeah, what I found most interesting about, about um, watching this is that the people who could see the issues most clearly were usually not religious. They're, they're oftentimes on the fringes of society, the kind of people that Jesus really would have associated with. And um, well, I met these street punks, you know, these, um, these people in Utah, and um, I barely mentioned the implantable microchip with them. And what they said was pretty, it was pretty good. Maybe we, we can check it out and check it out. Yeah, sure. have a look. Oh, the, the computer chip that they're going to put into us? That oh, yeah. You, you, hey, you know what? I think about that one. If you read the Bible, dude, it says you cannot buy, sell, or trade without the mark of the beast. It's so easy. It's convenient. It's right there. Beep. Oh, everything's right there. Beep. And I will never, ever put a chip in me or in my, any of my children. Oh no, that's I don't want to be up, marked. Man. The that's people that right. actually have the chips and the cards, they, you They're would weird. not believe how much that they actually waste. They're actually going to throw away enough to us unchipped people. We can actually survive, dude, without oh. chips. Because money is just paper shit. It's nothing. Why would I trade my, like paper shit that you can't use? You can't, there's no use for it. Like you can't make it into anything. You can't grow anything with it. This is not your property. This is property of the United States government, and this is a federal offense. Money, 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 I'll ever hear Woo! these days. Every song that the DJ plays, talking of a similar situation. Ain't got none and got to get some. Now you can't even tell it was here. All right? What is still here it's is right. us. Us, human beings. The people who need to take care of each other instead Oops. of taking care of yourself. I met someone at an alternative gathering who was like an atheist and he did much the same thing. He brought it up without me even mentioning it, you know, as soon as I mentioned the berry chip. And it still just amazes me how people who, you know, you wouldn't even consider to be religious can see the obvious even more than the supposed experts on the Bible. There's an interesting passage in the book of Revelations which talks about the mark that is placed on people where nothing shall be bought or sold without this mark. I'm not a Christian, I'm, I don't even believe in God in the conventional sense of the word. However, well, as with all ancient texts, texts, the Bible deserves to be looked at carefully and to see if there's anything in it that might be of interest historically. I'm hoping a time when maybe the genuine message of Jesus will come through. Did you see that? Did you see that? I'm hoping for maybe, this is an atheist saying, I'm hoping for the genuine message of Jesus to come through. I mean, that is a classic. Yeah, yeah you can imagine Jesus going around and gathering his disciples from people like this, you know? Yeah. They're all a bit radical in one way or another. Hardly a suit and tie amongst them. Yeah, I think the suit and ties, um, they're too busy trying to change the message to something like worshipping God on Sunday. I don't know a lot about the Mark of the Beast uh, yeah. prophecy and I don't know a lot about this chip thing, but from what you've told me just then, it seemed pretty similar. No, I'd never take a, I'd never take a chip, I'd never microchip myself. I, I think it's kind of interesting, like talking about people being chipped in the, in the future. I engage with wild food, engaging with like the natural world, wild plants, does make you wild in the sense that you want to rebel against standardization, um, manipulation, control, all these things which I think um, people are seduced into because they're being manipulated, because the world is so complicated, it's so stressful. Um, use, using plants in that way and relating to people in that way just makes you 
um, you, well, you will never be ripe for um, manipulation. You will always rebel. I'll never be treated voluntarily. They'll have to hold me down. They'll have to knock me out. Not taking the microchip could end up meaning that you would starve to death. I understand that. I'm not Christian myself, uh, and I'm, I'm not that knowledgeable about um, revelations, but uh, I know that um, when they talk of a, a mark of the beast, um, it's for buying and selling, and everyone in, in society must uh, bear this, this mark to operate and function. But there needs to be uh, some resistance uh, to this agenda on a practical level if it does um, end up that most people have got the microchip and there is a few resistors still out there I think they will be hunted down they'll, they'll be targeted for elimination I think I would refuse the very chip under all circumstances even if there was the, the threat of imprisonment the threat of death people from all religions know that something's wrong in these times. This is the most serious chess game that's ever been played. This game is so cunning, it is so deceptive. You, you, you can't say that this is of human origin. It is, it is, it is that, it, it is that, it is that um, in depth. It's the decisions that you make and whether you succumb to the system and just say, look, the pain and the misery that I'm feeling, I'll succumb to, you know, taking the very chip and so I can access food whereas for me I'd rather starve and eat rocks before I took it. That is great you know it's it is starting to show that there are actually some individuals out there who've got some character that seems to be so lacking in today's society the kind of character that would literally be willing to die before doing something that they know is uh, wrong. It seems like a lot of other people though have really missed the need to, you know, count the cost. I don't know that they have missed it though. I mean, you know, how many of them started backpedaling when we when we raised the question of what will you do when you can't buy or sell? Yeah, the kind of people who have what it takes to refuse a mark, I think they need to be they're gonna have to be like maybe fanatics, if I can say that, like idealists who'd be ready to give up everything change their whole entire lifestyle before they would go against their conscience. Maybe we messed up by, by not giving people the next um, chapter in the book of Revelation to read. You know the one where it really hits home how, how seriously God views this whole concept of the mark? Oh, well, this guy knows <laughs> what it's about. You can tell by what he's saying. Uh, but let me read it out. It says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Yeah, the Lamb in, in that passage is referring to Jesus. This isn't the kind of lovey-dovey stuff that most churchgoers would associate with God or Jesus, is it? But it's right there in the Bible. Maybe people should stop telling God how to do his business. And if he says there's going to be a day when he's had enough of mankind's disrespect for him, then so be it. Okay, and let me read on. And the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, whoever worships the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Yeah, from that, it seems that accepting the mark is the point of no return for mankind. And I think we're on the verge of that point right now in human history. Not the line in the sand, it's the line in the concrete. That is where it's drawn. I think that is where the soul is lost. It's as simple as that. It is, it is a choice of serve the mainframe or, the, or mammon or whatever you want to call it um, th but there is obviously a definitive line actually i did uh, let that one marketing guy who i interviewed in the cafe earlier read the passage um, which is probably why he fell to pieces so much my guess is um, that he'd never even heard of that passage before and he chose not to accept it probably because it was easier to stay in denial I don't know. I think that's very negative. I don't like to think of these things negative. I wouldn't want to read that paragraph then and think that's a negative thing. Just to, to, to take that leap from reading a warning sign to actually taking it to factual facts that it's happening is a massive leap of... I, I don't know. For me, I think that's a massive... I can see it as a warning and there's loads of sections which, you know, this is what we experience in this time and whatever and take heed of this. 
but I don't think it's that translatable to, to now, I don't think, for me. Yeah, I think it's interesting that the verse about not taking the mark of the beast is followed by a verse which talks about people dying for their faith. I mean, that's what it's coming to, you know, and that's what people don't want to think about. But here, let me read it. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commands of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven say to me, Write, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. One of the problems that I found about most religious discussions concerning the book of Revelation is that it's all about matching up symbols and dates or trying to convince people that your church is the one true church. It never seems to relate back to the teachings of Jesus. But when you recognize that the mark of the beast you know, is all about buying and selling, there is an obvious link. Jesus you know, commanded his disciples not to work for food, not to even think about where their material needs would be, you know, come from or you know, how they, they'd be met. But where is there anyone today actually teaching people to obey the teachings of Jesus? You know, Jesus made it clear that the choice would be between serving God or mammon, or God and the mainframe as that guy Greg put it earlier. Yeah, there's a guy here in the UK who's been living like without money for more than a year now. Mm. And he's not really the religious type, but he's got it really spot on about the buying and selling. And he seems to understand that it may cost us our lives in the end. Um, yeah, I've, I've been thinking about this and I feel like sometimes the soldiers of peace aren't as brave as the soldiers of war. And that um, if you see a if you see the soldiers of war going into battle, they're prepared to die for, for what they're doing. Um, we all need to be a little bit braver. We all need to stand up and, and be counted and be heard. I think we all, myself completely included, um, need to be braver. I've been living for last, the last 12 months um, without money. We used to find security in friends and family and the greater communities we lived in, we now see security in notes and coins. When we, when we buy and sell things, we're saying, I'm going to help you, but I want something in return. What, what better reason to help somebody than the fact they actually need some help? Like, do we actually always need to get something in return? Think about it, nobody goes to their dad, like, well, you know, I've cooked dinner this evening, that's five quid. If we all work together, share the resources, not only would it be better for the environment, but would we use less resources? It's much better for us as people. Yeah, Mark and his, some of his friends recently put on an, an alternative gathering in, in Bristol, which coincided with Buy Nothing Day. I think it was called the Free Economy Festival, and it was a fantastic day because everything was done for free. No money changed hands, no one was paid for what they did, and even the food itself was free because it was rescued from supermarket bins. Yeah, yeah, they fed more than a thousand people and there was still food left over. So it was a really good illustration of, of those, uh, what those street punks that you interviewed you were saying about how you could survive on what, what the you know, people throw away. Mm. Here's some footage of the gathering. Yeah. So just here at the Find uh, um, Nothing Day yeah. Festival and there's an army of volunteers as you can see fiddly prepping a three-course meal, which is going to be served later on. So it's great to be a part of this. Most of the food that I get is from the back of supermarkets. About, about 90% of, of all the food I eat yeah, gets, gets uh, found. Um, I'm just amazed that all this food goes to waste. Do I live to work or do I work to live? And do I give to earn or do I earn to give? And if I do my best for society, will it care about money or will it care about me? Do I, I think this is wonderful. It's really nice to all be under the same roof. I'm a language teacher, so I brought loads of uh, sort of French books and dictionaries and textbooks and stuff like that that I don't need. And I found chocolate spread, so I exchanged linguistic for chocolate spread. There you go my first experience uh, arriving and finding that everything's free. I think it, it feels nice to yourself to have donated something that you don't need anymore and then take something that you actually need. No, this is a new experience for me, but I would happily, you know, as long as it's still healthy, it's not going to make me ill. I have no qualms about eating food that's out of date. It was much nicer than going into a shop and exchanging money. Hello! Can I go one to 
going on? What we're doing is we're doing a clothes swap. So basically, any any clothes that you you like them, they're good clothes, but you just haven't worn them for a while. You bring them along, trade them in, like this nice jazzy waistcoat, waist yeah. and then see if you can find anything that you like. So I think it's a fantastic way of kind of. Uh, making an active decision to kind of not involve money in things, you know. You don't need money if people are prepared to shop, uh, shop, share and swap. A whole new word, swap. Um, <laughs> Swapping. Sounds slightly Dutch, swap. Um, yeah, good. We're shopping today. Shopping. Yes, it's like shopping, not quite. It's just a really fun day. It's so nice to see so many kids. It's nice to see so many people just really enjoying themselves. And, and also the slight bewilderment on people's faces when they're like, so I can just take this. It's like, well, yeah, it didn't cost us anything, so I just take it away. People are surprised that, that everything is free, but it's just proof that it can exist and it can happen. Money's a pain in the neck, isn't it? <laughs> it's useless. <laughs> it's like, controls people, turns people into, I don't know, things that they don't want to be. I'm uh, just doing whatever is thrown at me really. I was helping with some furniture being brought in. I uh, just chopping some potatoes now and clearing up later on and anything that he's doing, I'm, I'm up for doing it. I think I'm powering up the music system. <laughs> Not sure how. Certainly, I think like people's generosity of spirit is always there. Just needs to be given the space to sort of free freely flow. Yeah, it has been a bit overwhelming to be honest. I felt a bit emotional earlier, just like everybody giving their time for free. Working these guys work their arse off all day. Like I haven't seen I haven't seen people get paid a lot of money work this hard non-stop relentlessly. There's been a couple of thousand people through the doors here today at some point and just experiencing living without money for one day. I do think that is a significant point. Which point? Well, the fact that what happened there was just for one day. I mean, people had a lot of fun. We all did. But as we've seen from the other footage, it, it's going to take a lot more d dedication than that. I think Mark Boyle definitely could see that, but I'm not so sure that the others did. Um, you know, it's not just going to be about giving up the things we don't need. We may one day actually be forced to lay down our lives for, for one another. Yeah, I interviewed someone at that festival who was talking quite seriously about living without money. But it seemed like even in that setting, she seemed sort of somewhat cautious about what she was saying. I'm nervous about talking about it to people because even the hippiest of hippies get like their back, their prickles come up when you start talking about doing the job that you want to do and not having to um, enslave yourself for your money because no one wants to have to do it so everybody hates it so when someone comes along and says you don't need to do this you know everyone gets like but I do I have to and that that tension I think I think it all hangs on that tension in some ways I mean, it compromises your, you're never giving totally and you're never receiving totally when you're using money because you're always aware of the back current of the exchange. But when, you're use, when you don't use money, if you just are giving something and you're not thinking about what you're going to get back, it's a full-hearted gift. If you have to acknowledge to yourself your vulnerability and you cannot pretend that you're not vulnerable, when you've got money, it masks over your natural insecurities, the, the need that everybody has. We all pretend that we don't all share like, these basic needs and we can get away with that with money. But when there's no money, you're much more aware of how dependent on each other you are and you're much more open in your vulnerability which is a much more, it's a much more heart-centered, it's much braver, much more heart-centered way to live. Well, it's almost like a spirituality. There's that guy in the States, it is a spirituality for. Yeah. 
Yeah, I actually got an interview with Swello where he lives at his cave in Utah. He's the guy who's been living with that money for 10 years, right? Yeah, 10 years, yeah, that's right. Dang. This is like my home base here. <laughs> like I have a cave here. And I usually stay here in the winter time. The cave's small, so I can keep it warm in the winter pretty easily. But I also have a camp in town, and that I move around now and then. It's very temporary. Well, everything is. And often in warmer months, I travel around the country, just live wherever randomness takes me. I remember thinking, going through periods where I thought that, or I wondered why we didn't practice the teachings of Jesus. It's like he was more of an icon to be worshipped than to be followed in practice. We divide the world up among different religions and philosophies, but to me there's only two. And it doesn't matter whether you call it Christian, Hindu, Buddhist, whatever. Basically they all boil down to uh, love or money, God and mammon. The Buddha said there are two paths. One leads to wealth, one leads to nirvana. And Jesus said one leads to mammon and one leads to God. So those are the only two religions in the world. One's spiritual and one's materialism. Oh, there are no grounds under which I would allow myself to be microchipped. Yeah, we interviewed a lot of people about issues relating to this. Uh, there was that guy, Andy Hamilton, in, in Bristol, who's a co-author of the Self-Sufficient-ish Bible. Um, Fergus Drennan, who's a, a sort of famous wild forager. Greg Nicoletis, who's the founder of the We the People Will Not Be Chipped movement, who works closely with Catherine Albrecht. It's quite a few people. I think that uh, Swello and uh, Mark Boyle represent the two strongest proponents of this message, though. Uh, because I think they have their act together and they're more than just talk. Mm. So, and what about us? Are we going to include something about us in this documentary as well? Well, we are in the documentary right now. See that camera over there? So how do we include what we're doing in the film? Well, the cameras are rolling. Why don't we just talk into the camera? Okay. Here goes. <clears throat> so we don't normally live in houses like this. We don't live without money entirely, but we do live without working for money. And as a group, some of us have been living like this for more than 20 years. Right, we're freegans, which means we get most of our food from the back of supermarket dumpsters. We live and travel in vehicles that run on waste vegetable oil. Yeah, and we use solar panels to get our electricity from. But really, we're preparing for a time where we won't be having vehicles at all, and we'll be living pretty much like Swello. We have contacts in India, Kenya, Australia, America, and here in the UK as well. And next year we hope to have a base in Argentina. Yeah, that makes us sound huge, when in reality we're just a couple of dozen people at the moment. But we're training. We're learning how to survive just through faith in God. And we're preparing for a time when people of conscience in the world everywhere are going to have to survive without buying and selling. Some of us will die in the process, but there is a great need for us to be preparing right now. A big part of that preparation is getting the message out to others like we're doing with this film. But we need to be clear that it's not all about us either. It's about people finding a faith that's bigger than money and then linking up with others who have a similar kind of vision. There are dark times ahead, but God wants to prepare us for it by teaching us to take the message of Jesus seriously right now before the ax falls.